Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to be here, to gather with people who you have called out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you have redeemed us and changed us, that you have transformed us from the inside out, and that you have made us your children. Not because we deserve it, not because we're naturally born that way, but because you've adopted us. It's through the purchase that Jesus made on the cross. Lord, I thank you that we can stand before you completely justified because of what you've done. That anything that we do, anything that's good in us comes from you. And Lord, I pray for this morning, for each one of us, our souls and our minds, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you might strengthen us with wisdom and knowledge, and that you would help us to see you in a new light, that as you're revealed in the scriptures, that we might understand a truer picture of you. So Lord, help us as we look and guide us along in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be in Mark chapter 9, which is kind of a momentous thing. Most of you know it as the transfiguration. So we're going to see Jesus, actually, the, the veil of his flesh is going to be unfurled, and you're going to actually see him for who he truly is without his humanity getting in the way. And that's really what the transfiguration is about. So in verse 7, it says that a cloud came and overshadowed them, meaning Jesus and the disciples, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And boy, that's really good advice, right? Amen. When God has to show up personally and drop that word in your ear, it's probably very needed because he doesn't normally do that, right? So he makes a personal appearance. So last week we were in Mark chapter 8. If you remember, this is kind of the, the peak of Jesus' ministry where he begins to explain to his disciples that when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be turned over to the chief priests and the officials. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be dead and buried. But on the third day, he will rise. And he begins to share this and kind of help his disciples to understand what's coming. And he says, it's not just me who's going to die, but you have to die too if you want to follow me. You have to die to yourself, your own ambitions and your desires and the plans that you might even have for your life. And so Jesus begins to tell them to expect the worst because it's coming. He heals this blind man. It's interesting because just previous to that, he asks them, he says, don't you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Do you not yet perceive? Don't you understand? Why do you think it's about bread? Remember that whole thing? He had those nine questions he asked them. And then the next thing you see Jesus do is he finds this blind man and he heals him. And he heals him in a very unorthodox way by using spit. If you were blind, would you mind? <laughs> no. Yeah, you could you, you could throw you know fling cat poo at me if you wanted to, uh, if it's going to give me sight. But Jesus uses that, which is a rather interesting mode, and he doesn't ever use it again in the same way. And I love that because we don't get stuck into a recipe. And Jesus, it's supposed to be who. <laughs> Every once in a while, there are these telltale signs that you know Pastor Dave was typing. This was not cut and paste. This is all fresh, okay? Jesus asks the disciples, he says, who do, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say uh, one of the prophets. And he goes, who do you say that I am? And you know, that's the most important question that anyone can answer. Amen. Who is Jesus? Peter comes out with this great statement. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he makes this strong statement. And then a little bit later, when Jesus begins to tell him how he's going to be turned in and betrayed, and he's going to be crucified. But don't worry, Sunday's coming. He's going to be raised on the third day. Peter takes him aside and tells him, you got to stop, stop all this negative talk, Jesus. And he calls him Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are mindful of the things of men and not of God. So Jesus calls, I, I don't know if anybody's looked at your face and called you Satan before, but uh, it, it should make you kind of go, hmm, I wonder if I'm speaking by the, the wrong spirit. 
And then Jesus begins to talk about what discipleship really looks like. He says in verse 34, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. So Jesus is talking about denouncing ourself if we want to be a disciple, dethroning our selfish ambition, uh, not all ambition, but selfish ambition, right? You guys think that all ambition is bad? No. Of course not. Selfish ambition is terrible. But ambition to do things that God wants you to do and you do it with fire, I'd, mother, I'd much rather be with a bunch of people that have a desire and a passion to do something rather than people that have a desire to do nothing. Okay, none of you are really feeling that like I do. Okay. <laughs> We've got to dethrone our drive for ourselves and make sure we get off the throne and make sure Jesus stays there in our hearts and in our minds and our priorities, in the things that we talk about, in the places we go, in what we occupy our time with, how we spend our money. All of that is what Jesus wants. He doesn't just want to be added to the recipe of our life. He's not a spice. In fact, he is our life. And living our life and taking our life now and saying, well, I'm in it for whatever is good and pleasurable and enjoyable for me, you will have no eternal life with him. And that's the exchange. You either live it now or you're going to live it later. You live it now for him and you'll live it later forever. And Jesus says in verse 36, so what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? You know, when you think about it reasonably, it makes sense. What would you give in exchange for your soul? People have numbers. There are movies made of it. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation, sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory with his Father and with his holy angels. You see, Jesus is communicating to us that if, if we're, I mean, if there's true faith, it's going to be able to be seen. It's going to be seen by what you're willing to say no to. And there's, there's a great deal of freedom in the word no, right? Because if you say yes to everyone, I mean, it makes for a funny movie, but it doesn't make for a good life. Because what you're doing is you're pleasing people instead of God. And we can get very lost doing that. So we talked about that and how, boy, we're going to have to really get used to disappointment if we're going to turn our back on Jesus. So this week, we're going to be in chapter 9. If I can figure out how to tap something. We're going to take a closer look at Jesus as he go, takes his disciples up on top of a high mountain. I'll just read this, the, most, the majority of the passage for you as you read along with me. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them to a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. You get the idea that they didn't really catch what Jesus was pitching about his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection, and being raised from the dead. Of course, the, uh, 
the, the whole biblical, the rabbinical history is, you're going to raise from the dead when God calls all the souls to himself on the great day of judgment. And so they had a, a wonderful idea of that, and they're wondering, well, how is it that I'm going to wait till then to say something? That, that doesn't seem right. So, but they're wondering, and Jesus is going to help them along. I just want to be, uh, I want to be a little bit more teachy today than I usually am. So if you can just put on your, on your little, you know, learning hats. I'm going to teach you something about when you read through the Bible, how to rightly understand it. I know I'm going to be absolutely stepping on toes here. But the scripture in 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The scripture says that we are to be good work men or work women, understanding the scripture and able to rightly divide it. In other words, this is what this means. That is what that means. This is where this goes. And it's like a chessboard. Everything has a space and you know how it all goes together. When you don't know, my goodness, you can make a mess, right? So how do you do that? How do you read the Bible in a critical fashion? How do you read it in a scholastic fashion? How do you read it in an empathic fashion? How do you read it in a sensual re way? There are all of these different ways to be able to read through the Bible and look at it. And I just want to bring up a couple of ways that you can do this. Number one is you want to know what it says. As you read the passage, it's amazing. Most people say, you know, I read through that passage a hundred times and I never saw that. You ever do that? You read through a passage, you go, I had no idea that that was even there. I've had conversations today. People say, I can't believe it. I missed it. I stumbled over it. Well, if you're not careful to pay attention to what the Bible says, you might insert something that you are presupposing. Oh, well, I heard a pastor say one time, or I listened to a, a podcast, which, you know, they're always right because they're on the internet. <laughs> so you have to be careful that you don't not read the scripture and know what it says. And yet it starts with that. And sometimes you can go into the original language, which helps. And I'll do a little bit of that today. But what does it say? Does it say what you think it says? You need to read it word for word exactly as it said, because it's God's word. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He took great pains to make sure it's written as it is. So we should read it as it is. That will dispel a lot of confusion. And we can be a, a workman who is worthy to be able to rightly divide the word. What does it mean? Okay. You can read something like the word Mephibosheth. And you go, what the heck is that? Well, what does it mean? You might have to do a little research, crack some books, open up the internet. There's a million ways to be able to do it. What does it mean? Bethel means the house of God. It was a place that was named by Jacob, and he called it the house of God. It was called something else previously, but we all know it as Bethel. Oh, the house of God, because God was in this place, and I did not know it. That's what he quotes in that place. So when you understand the meaning of things, what does it actually mean? It helps you to understand the context of the scripture. What do I do about it? Now, we're going to read through uh, this, this great story of how Jesus is transformed, and we're going to say, wow, that's great. So what? I, I just read a novel, <laughs> you know, War and Peace. So what? What are you going to do with that? Uh, I'm just going to remember it and talk to people and let them know, because it was a really long book, and I want everyone to know how hard I worked. Okay, great. Good luck. Good luck with that. But what do you do? The word of God is different than anything else because it's a pattern for life. And if you just read it for what it says and what it means, you'll be as intelligent as a Pharisee if you don't put it into practice. You can't just make a beautiful meal. You have to eat it. Follow? Okay. These three words are called observation, interpretation, and application. I went with the longer meaning so that all of us would understand. But it's observing what is said in the text. It's interpreting what it means. And then application is so, the so what. How do I apply that to my life? You guys get that? Mm -hmm. yep. It's a really good way to read the scripture. You read through and you go, ah, what? Well, what does it say? 
because you might be walking away with some misinterpretations just because you don't know what it says. And then what does it mean? You get some more information, some details, and then you apply it to yourself. Make sense? There are some people that go right to the application and they misapply it because they don't understand what it says or what it means. So those are a couple of little guidelines before we jump into the passage. There are questions you can ask of the passage. I do this all the time and I usually throw them out and stump most of you. Like, what did Jesus mean by that? And people go, not all of you, some of you. You ask the W questions, the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. All of that are good questions to ask of the passage. If you're going to study it and rightly divide the word of truth, the workman, it does not need to be ashamed. These are the questions that you ask of the passage. And God's got giant shoulders, by the way. You can ask him anything. He won't be offended. Like some of you coming to my office, you knock on my door, Pastor Dave, I'm really sorry. I don't mean to bother you. Am I bothering you? I'm so sorry. I know you're busy. And listen, you can go to God like, like a child. In fact, he enjoys that. Go to him and just dump your gut. He already knows it. It's better off for you to be honest. But you can ask questions. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. You can use your five senses and tackle something, and it may uncover something you didn't see before. Uh, an example, John chapter 21. Jesus appears to the disciples while they're fishing. Peter says, I had enough waiting around for Jesus. I'm going fishing. They jump in a boat. He takes this ragtag bunch of non-fisherman types fishing, and they're out all night. Peter's stripped down to his underwear because he's doing all the work, apparently. And the sun begins to come up, which tells you you've been up all night. Any of you know what that's like? Yeah, shame on you. Anyway, so... You've been up all night and the sun begins to come up and there's somebody on shore, I guess, who's looking for some fresh fish and says, hey, kids, you got any food? And I know every eye turns to Peter and Peter goes, no. Stinking guys, they can't even row. They don't know which way to go. I got to do everything. I can see Peter doing that because I think I'm a lot like him. But maybe that's not what it says. So, he goes, well, throw the net on the other side and you'll have fish to spare. And John is the one who realizes it's Jesus. And so Peter then throws it in high gear, throws, throws the net over the side, and he's got so many fish, they can't even pull the net into the boat, which is how you land all those fish. You got to get them in the boat. If you don't get them in the boat, you could lose them. Peter takes one look at Jesus. He throws on his outer garment, which is like putting on a winter coat, and then he jumps in the water. And he swims to Jesus, and then he just stands there looking at him. Jesus has a fire, and the fire is a coal fire. Coal has a certain smell, doesn't it? The last time a coal fire was smelled is when he denied Jesus three times. And he was gathered around a coal fire. And so I wonder if that scent triggered him to remember the denying of Jesus three times. I don't know him. So you can take your senses and apply it to a passage and find like these really cool little nuggets to give you a bit more insight as to what the passage is talking about or what the character is going through. Does that make sense? I know it was a long example. I'm sorry. So you can apply your senses. What do you see? What do you taste? What do you, what do you smell? What do you feel? Is, is there wind? Is it cold? Is it hot? What's the elevation? What's the weather? All of those kind of questions will help you to get into the story. It helps you understand it. The context. The context is king. If you know anything about cults, and I imagine you might, what they do is they'll go in and they'll pull one passage and they'll put that in your hand and say, this is the most important passage in the whole Bible. And yet there isn't a passage like it anywhere else in the scripture. And they'll tell you that that scripture means something that it doesn't mean. And that's how cults are started. A lot of people have lost their lives following leaders who cherry pick. They'll pull something out and they'll make it something it's not because they're not reading it in context. Because there's stuff said before and there's stuff said after. And there are 66 books to look at. And if you don't understand the context, you can take it out of the context. If the text is out of the context, 
All you have is a pretext or a con. If you take the text out of the context, all you have is con. So content is, the context is king, and how does it fit into the scripture? And then there are other internal references that you can find. We have four gospels. We have four different points of view of this story. And so you can flip back and forth and look at some of what this one says and some of what that says. All four of them are observational notes. Some are going to write some things that others don't. And you'll get a fuller picture if you put them all together. You guys understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And so this is some of the stuff that we do when we get a Bible study together or when we're studying a passage or when we want to understand truly what the scripture is saying. You have to consider all these things and it will really enrich your Bible study. And that's the end of my teaching portion. So that will help you. Let's see if you can figure out what I'm doing as I go through. Verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Well, Jesus makes this pledge to them. There are some of you here. First of all, what did he say? Some of you. He didn't say all of you, right? You might assume he's talking to all his disciples, but he says some. One of those observational things. Number two, he says, before you die, so something's going to happen before all of the disciples or some of those disciples die. So that's the timing of the event that Jesus is talking about. So it can't be something we're looking to happen yet, right? Because they're all gone. They're with the Lord. They're home. We'll catch up. And he says, you're going to see it, which tells me there's a particular sense that will be involved. There's going to be a sight. The kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? You know, there's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. You know, they're not the same thing. That's why it's important to see exactly what it says, because if you're studying a thing, you think he says the kingdom of heaven. It's not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven actually is a temporary setup. The kingdom of God is a permanent one. And there's a whole study. I won't go into it. I'm so sorry to tease you with that, but that's it. <laughs> the kingdom of God will be present with power. Deutimus is the word. It's where we get the word dynamite. It's going to be explosive. It's going to be wow. It's going to be something. Before you die, you're going to see the kingdom of God. Ta-da! And guess what we just read about? Six days later, Jesus takes some of the disciples, and they go up onto the mountain, and they see Jesus transformed. And the kingdom of God. We got, we got officers of the kingdom there, and they're having a meeting. That's what this is talking about. That's why context is important. This wasn't written haphazardly. It was written in an orderly fashion. So Jesus says there's going to be this thing that's going to happen that some of you will see. Question, why, don't, why didn't Jesus reveal himself to all of his disciples? I don't know. Why do you know him better than me maybe in some areas? Why is it that you only spend time with certain people that you choose? Is that wrong? How come I've never been to your house for dinner? <laughs> you know I like food. So here's the thing. Jesus does what Jesus does because Jesus is Jesus, and he can do that, and he should have our ut utmost respect, and, and we should concentrate what's on our own plate. Matthew 16, 28, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man. By the way, that's his reference to himself. It's a title for the Messiah. Coming in his kingdom. So you see, it's worded slightly different in Matthew. But it's basically the same thing. So you guys are going to see, some of you are going to see heaven open and the kingdom of God before you die. So He's preparing them for that before he moves on. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. So, who? It's Peter, James, and John, right? Where? On a high mountain. Which mountain? 
Oh, boy. Because whenever there's a question mark, you've got, you know, 12 scholars with 18 opinions. <laughs> well, where are they? They're in a place called Caesarea Philippi, by the way. And the nearest high mountain, in fact, it's the highest mountain in Israel, is Mount Hermon, which is, ta-da, that's what it looks like. So, did Jesus truck hundreds of miles away to do this thing, or did he do it locally? He probably did it locally. So it's probably Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is interesting because it's one of the only places that in Israel that you can do Winter Olympics year-round. Because the peaks of the mountains are so high, they're always covered with snow. It's one of those interesting facts. And this is the elevation, and this is where they just were in, our, in the context, and this is where Mount Hermon is. So it's, it's roughly 10 miles from here to this little pin. So I think it's Mount Hermon, even though it's not mentioned, and I won't die on that hill. I'm pretty sure it's Mount Hermon. So there are some educated guesses that you can make based upon context, where if you read you know, some famous person, they'll say, oh, no, it was Mount Tabor. It's about 80 miles to the south. I don't think so. He only took two, three of them. He didn't take 12 of them. So anyway, it's 9,232 feet. Now that, just so that you know, it's, it's pretty tall. It's a big mountain. We don't have mountains in New Jersey like this. Wish we did. So after six days, we have who he took, Peter, James, and John, and he led them to a high mountain apart by themselves. Jesus ever take you away by yourself? Some of us are deathly afraid of that. You mean alone? With no TV, no internet? No phone? Oh no. Can you imagine being alone? What a great practice it is to get alone. There are things that you'll digest mentally, spiritually, emotionally that you won't digest it's like getting a flat tire on the parkway. You get a flat tire on the parkway, you better pull over, right? Mm -hmm. There are some people that don't. Yeah, it, it's not a good thing. But when we just continue to roll on and we don't digest life in a proper context, boy, we, we wear out. We wonder why we're burning out. We wonder why we're worn out. There, there are things that we need to talk about with the Lord all the time. And he may be calling you to get away. How many of you like vacation? Hardly any of you. That's amazing. Because I'm going to be whisking my wife away as soon as the service is over, so I better conclude. Um, so we're going away for a little while, and we're going to just relax and throw it in neutral and, re and take it easy. I periodically have to do that if I want to stay married. You laugh because you know I'm right. Yes. yes. So Jesus takes them aside by themselves, and he was transfigured. By the way, there's the Greek word, and there's the Greek letters, just so I can seem as though I'm more intelligent than you. No, I cut and pasted it. You'll notice that word looks a lot like metamorphosis, which you guys probably learned in, like, junior high school. Metamorphosis. Metamorpho. -oo. It means to be changed, to be metamorphosized, to be changed from the inside out. A caterpillar to a butterfly, you guys probably know that, or a tadpole to a frog. What happens is it changes from its early stages to its final stage, which was already built into the mechanism. Isn't that interesting? Just like a caterpillar to a butterfly, it's still a caterpillar. And it has all the stuff it needs to be a butterfly. It just isn't time yet. You see, this is Jesus out of the chrysalis. And we're going to get to see him as he truly is, metamorphosized. He's going to be transfigured and transformed and changed. It's interesting because it's used two other times in the New Testament. Here in Romans 12.1, where Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's the thing about change. You can't stay the same. And the thing that you once were, you can't be. You have to be something different. 
Your body has to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, it's not unreasonable to give God everything since he gave everything for us. And do not be conformed to this word, but world, but be transformed. That's the same word. To be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's this transformation that's going to happen in our minds, which works itself out in the rest of our life. And it begins by us dying to ourselves again, like Jesus was just talking about. And so that plays very well with what we've been talking about. And there's a process, by the way. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the scripture says that we're always being changed to become more like Jesus. By the way, that's the normal process of what it is to be a Christian. It means that God is always teaching you, training you, refining you, and we're always in the process of becoming that which God has already called us to be. That make sense? That's the metamorphosis. That's what it is when you tell somebody, are you a Christian? And they go, yeah, I've been a Christian since I was a kid, Sunday school, all that jazz. Oh, that's great. Do you, do you know Jesus? Well, I, I know about him. And it's different, isn't it? Knowing Jesus is different than knowing about Jesus. I mean, I know a lot about a lot of famous people, but I don't know any. But I know Jesus. And I know he knows us. So Jesus was transfigured and his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow. By the way, some of you people won't wear white in the winter. It's going to be hard for you to be in heaven. <laughs> Such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. It's interesting that Mark would say that, you know, like you've never seen Clorox do this. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. This is very strange. Any of you ever see anything like this before? Please don't raise your hand. This is a unique event where Jesus' clothes are suddenly transparent. And he begins to radiate light like the sun, one of the other passages likens it unto. And he's shining to the point where they can't look at him. I have never lit up like that. I, you know, we sing this little light of mine. I don't have that kind of light. But Jesus does. So what was Jesus doing? This, you know, this is where we ask questions of the text, right? What was he doing? How did, I mean, did he take them up there just to go like a lamp, uh, you know, just to show off? Is that what he was doing? Was it, a, was it an office meeting? He says, guys, wait here. I, I have a meeting. I'll be right back. Is that how it rolled out? Well, Luke 9, 29, which is a parallel passage to this, it says, and as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. It was as Jesus prayed. Jesus got lit up when he prayed. It wasn't just, you know, turning like a light. It's when he prayed. Do you think that's significant? I think so too. If I didn't turn the page and go to Luke, I would have missed that. You see, that's why it's good to look at all these things and look at them together because we get a fuller picture of the whole thing. Jesus praying, and by the way, the disciples were praying too, but they do what they always do when they pray. They fell asleep. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times he goes, guys, 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 stay awake, pray with me. I'm, I'm like distressed to the point of death. Just pray with me. And he come back and they're all snoozing, you know, probably snoring hard. And Jesus wakes them up and say, guys, couldn't you stay and pray with me for an hour? And he does that three times. And the third time he says, wake up, my betrayer's here. I'll see you later. They could have spent that time with Jesus, but they spent time sleeping. Well, the very same thing happens here, believe it or not. And we don't see it here in the text because it doesn't say that, but it does in another one. So what does a resurrected body look like? 
Because you've got two people here. You've got Moses and Elijah. Moses, who represents the law, and you've got Elijah, who represents the prophets. You remember how Moses died? Maybe you don't. Maybe you weren't there. Moses died on Mount Nebo, and it says that the Lord buried him. We get this interesting passage in the book of Job, or Jude, rather, where he tells us that there was an argument over the body of Moses because the devil wanted to do something with it. Probably turn it into a relic. <laughs> but anyway, there was this argument. You can look it up in the book of Jude. I didn't have it here. but So Moses is buried. Where's Elijah's tomb? He didn't have one because the Lord translated him. Raptured him, if you will. So you got one guy who died naturally and the other guy who died who didn't die. Had an unnatural thing. And there's two witnesses here. It's rather interesting. Jesus brought three with him because two or three are witnesses. And it will actually prove that the event really occurred. So there's a lot going on here, guys. And I'm wondering, what did these guys look like? And did they have name tags? Hi, I'm Moses. Good to meet you. Like you're at some business meeting or something? They knew it was Moses and Elijah. How did they know? Because they suddenly were teleported into another time and space of life, into heaven itself, if you will, was revealed, and they got a little peek behind the curtain. I think we're going to know and remember everybody's name in heaven. I so look forward to that because my brain is gone. I meet somebody and say, hi. I've never met you before. We had a long conversation last week, Pastor. <laughs> I'm sorry. People, people come in the door and, and the greeters are like, I don't recognize them. And I don't know if they're a first time visitor, but I can't ask them. Because maybe, hi, good morning. Yes, here. Here you go. Next. You know. We don't like to forget stuff, right? By the way, speaking of forgetting stuff, we have a coffee house tonight. Oh, is this news? We have a coffee house this evening. There's a big sign out front, and maybe you could watch it as you're going out. So I, I would like to invite you all back for the coffee house. I think it'll be fabulous. So I just inserted uh, an announcement right in the middle of the sermon. Sorry. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we get a, a, vi a vision of Jesus from John in the book of Revelation. And it says that his head and hair were white like wool and white as snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass as if refined in the furnace, like he's got an awesome tan. And his voice as the sounds of many waters. When Jesus speaks, it sounds like Niagara. I, you know, I can't even do it. So we're given a vision of Jesus in his resurrected state. We're given a little peek of him here, but we're going to see him in the book of Revelation. And he's got eyes like flames of fire. Now that, you know, you don't run into that every day. It's a little awe-inspiring, isn't it? And I don't know... But when I read the scriptures, it says that we will be resurrected very much like Jesus. And because we have hope that he was resurrected, we have a hope of resurrection as well. And that our bodies will be make, made like unto his. So I don't know about the burning eyes thing, but there, everybody wears white in heaven. Angels, always white. The Shekinah glory, always a bright white cloud that's shining. Everything's bright and white. Jesus' hair is even white. So, I'll, I'll fit in by the time I get there. So, what were they talking about? Well, does the scripture tell us what they were talking about? Not this one. But if you go to the parallel passage in Luke, it says, And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They were talking about him going to the cross. Isn't that interesting? Jesus' exodus, if you will. He was talking to Moses about his exodus. 
He was talking to Elijah about his exodus or his translation, if you will. Isn't that interesting? You've got two people who have gone on before Jesus and experienced one a physical death and a burial and the other one a translation straight up. And they're talking to Jesus about what he's going to accomplish. You see, Jesus being crucified on a cross was not a failure. It was an accomplishment. It was a goal. It was the fulfillment of a purpose. It wasn't, oh, gee, nobody listens to me and they're going to kill me now. It wasn't a failure. It was exactly as God ordained it. He was talking about him dying in Jerusalem. So apparently, everybody seems to get it but the disciples. And Jesus is trying to tell them over and over. So what would you do if you saw Jesus and suddenly he was all lit up and, you know, I, I've, I've never seen Jesus like this before. You know, I've seen him break bread and feed 5,000 and 4,000 and I've seen him heal people. I've seen all that kind of stuff, but I've never seen him lit up like a nightlight. And having a conversation about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, I've never seen that. What would you do? I mean, if you were faced with that, how would you react? And so this is something you do with the text as well. Ask questions. So, so what is that to me? How would I react to this? How would I, what would I do? Well, here's Peter's example. Um, whether it's a good one or a bad one, I'll let you decide, or maybe I won't. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why did he say this? Because he did not know what to say. For they were greatly afraid. Any of you never saw that before? You never saw that before? He did not know what to say, so he spoke. <laughs> it's like running into, uh, you know, a, a, a sports hero or, you know, somebody who's a hero of yours, who's famous, you know, and you meet them and you go, uh, 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 hi. <laughs> Peter didn't know what to say, so he spoke. <laughs> I could think of a couple better things to do. Peter answered a question that was not asked. It says, then Peter answered. Nobody's talking to Peter. Peter's on the outside looking in. He's a spectator, which is what he should have kept doing. He should have been listening instead of speaking. But no. He's got to rush into the limelight, right? He's got to be part of what's going on, man. I got to jump in. I got to be part of this. This is awesome. It's, it's good that we're here. I like it here. Thanks, Peter. I, I feel less stupid. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 3 says this. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. We're given some deep wisdom here, guys. If, if you've got a lot going on in your life and your heart is anxious about a lot of stuff and you're running around trying to get things done, you're going to go to bed and you're going to have the crazy dreams. Just like somebody who uses a lot of words is eventually going to trip themselves up. Because with the abundance of words, sin is not absent. I think Peter should have just calmed the heck down and listened. Because they were talking. He could have got in on what they were talking about. But instead, he comes up with this brilliant idea and tries to force it upon these celestial beings. Please try never to interpose commentary when Jesus is speaking. I find this to be a good principle. Try not to say 
anything when Jesus is speaking, right? Listen, my, when I open the word, it's not for me to be looking at my phone, reading the word. He deserves my 100% attention and I should listen rather than speak. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the world's doing. Everybody's shooting bombs. What's new? In Psalm 19, verses 13 to 14, it says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. This is David praying to God. This is a good prayer, by the way. Keep me from presuming. You know what it is to presume? I'm walking down the hallway, two people having an intimate conversation rather close together, and I happen to be walking by, and my ear catches part of their conversation. And I feel, I have an opinion on that. And so I turn, because I'm Pastor Dave, and I say, you know what you should do? I should mind my own stinking business, don't you think? And yet I feel I must always add my opinion because it's so valuable to me. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Maybe not everyone needs your opinion. Maybe not everyone needs your opinion. You don't have to have an opinion about everything. And if you do, keep it to yourself. Like Peter did not. I got an idea. Let's build three tabernacles, one for each of you. What do you want us to, you want three outhouses and we're going to live in them. Is that right? Do you think that's what Peter was doing? What's the plan here? You, you know, you got to go to ShopRite or Costco, you know, like you, you, you need things. You can't live up here. What are you doing? And so you have to wonder, what was he thinking? At least I asked those questions. What was he thinking? What caused Peter to blurt out this bit of wisdom, do you think? That's sarcastic for this blurting. What do you think his plan was? Why do you think he did it? Well, it's a good thing we have four parallel passages. Luke 9, 32 and 33 says, but Peter and those with him were heavy in sleep. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him, Moses and Elijah were going away. And Peter said to Jesus, master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and Moses and Elijah not knowing what he said. You see, he was under the influence of this anxiety. Oh, no, 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 don't leave. Don't let this end. This has to, you know, they're, they're leaving? No, no, I got abandonment issues. You can't leave. You see what Peter was trying to do? First of all, he was asleep. <laughs> And he woke up to this event going on. He probably shook his buddies and said, check this out. Am I dreaming? And it's happening. And then he sees Moses and Elijah going away. And he goes, wait, I'll make espresso. <laughs> you know, like he just didn't want it to end. Do you guys feel that? I, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I come over to your house for dinner and we have salad and they say, hey, yeah, hey, it was a good salad. Listen, I got to go. You what? Wait, I got a, I got a lamb in the oven. And we got four more hours. <laughs> I'm just wishing. Anyway, so this is the motivation. And if, and if you're good about flipping back and forth and you don't mind doing a little bit of digging, you find all these things. A lot of things here, right? Amen. You get to find people's motivations and why they're doing things. So, Nothing is better than something if your something is really nothing. <laughs> if what you're going to say doesn't add, then don't say it. Right? P 
Peter wasn't adding anything. <laughs> you know, uh, they had a plan. They had, a, they had a, a, an office meeting, if you will. And it, Peter wasn't invited to it. In fact, he was asleep, and he woke up in the middle and then suddenly wanted to tell everybody what to do. Any of you have that personality? <laughs> Don't you dare look at me with those eyes. <laughs> For us to be humble and to listen instead of speak can be very difficult. And yet, I think God will bless it if we do that because we will know things that we wouldn't otherwise know and will behave in such a way that glorifies God instead of speaking foolishness. So, nothing is better than something if your something is really nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. I just cut that short, didn't I? And so this was probably his idyllic dream. We've got tents for everybody, not just, not just a booth, which is small, but actual tents. Now, I don't know where Peter thought he would get this merchandise. The Home Depot wasn't around yet. It's good that we're here so we could build these things, right, guys? I could see them looking like... Okay. Mountaintop experiences are so nice. You know, where everything is right with the world and you have no trials and no difficulties and no hardships and you're just in the presence of Jesus and a couple of friends and you just want to stay there. It's like going to see Daniel on a Saturday. <laughs> but you know, when you leave the show and you get in the bus... Real life will hit you. <laughs> People tell me these things. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I have to report to you everything that happened to Daniel. We actually had, a, we had an elder meeting. We talked all about it. Anyway. <laughs> and Carl, the elder of fun, he is going to make sure that all subsequent <laughs> trips will be better. <laughs> but here... Here's this great idea that Peter thinks he has this great idea. It's not such a great idea. What you don't know is it's time for them to leave, and Jesus is going to take, tell the disciples, let's go. And they have to go down the mountain. And they're going to get to the bottom of the mountain and rejoin the other disciples. And chaos is happening at the bottom of the mountain. There's a couple who has brought their son to the disciples so that the demon inside their son would be cast out. And we've got some scribes who are there commenting about how the disciples are doing everything wrong. And there's a mob. And this is what Jesus and James and John and Peter are walking into. So for Peter to say, let's just stay up here I get that. It's like the worst day of vacation is the last day. Because the last day involves packing, bringing everything back, and then you get home, and then you got laundry to do, and you got plants that are dying, you know, you got animals that have, you forgot about, you know, like all these things have to happen. And so I appreciate Peter's heart that he just wants to stay up there. But you can't stay up there. That should be a place where we derive encouragement and strength so that we can go down into the valley, so that we can be the people of God that we're to be. It's not like, Pastor, can't we just have a three hour long sermon? I could sit here all day. Well, then you won't be able to put anything into practice. You won't actually get to put the roller skates on and try them out. I got through six whole verses today. <laughs> and a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. If God were from Jersey, he'd say, this is Jesus. Pay attention. Listen up. Because what did they do? They put Moses and Elijah and Jesus all in the same plane. And this show was all about Jesus. Amen. And he's high above any other human being. And Peter didn't get it. And God the Father took a personal affront and showed up. Hey, 
This is my son. Hear him. There's only three times God has to show up, and this is one of them. He says, listen to him. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. So as soon as this cloud comes, by the way, I believe this is the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God, where he comes and shows himself. He was in the temple and he made himself present there. You'll also notice he was like this wonderful barrier for the Egyptians to not invade God's people in the wilderness. And so we see it all, all throughout the Old Testament, this Shekinah, this, this cloud, not a dark cloud, but a bright cloud. It's the very presence of God. And then his voice comes out, which boy, aren't you looking forward to hearing that? I always think it's going to be James Earl Jones. <laughs> but the infamous cloud, God shows up and he begins to speak. God the Father steps into the scene to correct Peter's offense of putting Jesus on equal billing with Moses and Elijah. And he says, this is my son. Listen to him. And after this reproof, poof. And all they saw was Jesus in themselves. You know, when God comes and speaks, everything else will melt away. And it'll just be you and Jesus. Jesus. That's, that's a good deal. In Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9, this is the Lord speaking. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, I should just make such a subtle thing that you would pick up on it and follow my direction just by wherever it is that God looks. He doesn't have to speak. He doesn't have to point. He doesn't have to come out of a cloud. He just needs to put his eye on something. That's the way we should be. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. So the scripture is, don't be like a stubborn donkey. Don't be somebody that has to be strapped up and yanked around for you to do what the Lord wants you, wants you to do. Be somebody who's willing where you're actually watching, listening, responding to the things that he would have you do. Have your face in the book. My goodness, we, we really cut ourselves short if we don't do that. So the father is leaving a real lasting impression on Peter. Peter in 2 Peter gives us his first person testimony years later of what happened. He says here in verse 16, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice, such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. Peter gives a first person testimony of what happened. And he says, it was awesome. In Isaiah 55, and I'm going to close with this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return to the Lord, that he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I wanted to add that at the end of this testimony about Peter, because the Lord loves him, and still loves him, and restores him, and is patient with him, just like you, and just like me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. 
it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. So God says, just like the rain comes down and waters everything so that we can all live and be alive, so his word comes into our lives and causes us to be spiritually alive and thriving. So that's kind of the bottom line. Guys, I'm going to drop it right there. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and we'll look at the tail end of the transfiguration next week.